Let us now make our voices heard. I pledge to serve and to push my country. I pledge to live like a citizen. Today I have something special. I'm going to have some background music. Ready to go. Oh, I love it. My Sunday morning routine, I wake up, go straight for the coffee, make sure it's just about 9 o'clock. If it's not, make a second cup of coffee. And then I turn on KEXP because that's preaching the blues. And I listen to it till noon, usually. I've done this for years and years and years and years and years. And my daughter now lives in Ashland, Oregon. And thank goodness we have uh, streaming radio stations, of which KEXP is one of the best in the world. And now she listens to it, so I love that. Thank you. I didn't know that it was going to be this kind of music. Here we go. My name is Janae Kane. I'm the co-founder of Citizen University, and I welcome you to Civic Saturday! <laughs> if this is your first time here, welcome. If this is your second, third, fourth, fifth, third year we're working on, welcome. We're going to mix things up today a little bit, and more on that in a moment. All I am really here to do is to announce that we have made official, we have two artists in residence. We have Michael Feldman, our musician in residence. He's going to be working with us throughout this year. And also, we have a second artist in residence, our poet in residence. Please welcome Na. So before I start any type of poetry, I would like us to have a meditation moment. I know that many of you have traveled from different places, have used different modes of transportation to get here, probably are sitting down wondering what's going to happen after I speak, <laughs> probably thinking about what's going to happen after this whole thing is done, what's going to happen when you get home, are you going home, what's going to happen tonight, I don't know, so many things. But right now, I am here only to bring you to the present. Only to bring you to the now. Only to bring you to the pleasantries of the present. So with that, I ask you to, if you are able to, to place your right hand upon your heart. And to close your eyes, if you are comfortable, and give honor to the heart that beats for you. And to give honor to the breath that you are still breathing. So just breathe at your own pace, in and out. Your heart is worthy. Your breath is worthy. Now words. We humans inhabit time and space. Each breath in married to the shorthand. Each breath out married to the long. What do you long for? To be remembered, to leave a legacy, each breath in marks a moment in history. Each breath out shifts our perspective of tomorrow. Can we borrow time and ask it to teach us, not to taunt us about yesterday? Will yesterday have a hint for us about the future? While the present continues to ask, 
What do you long for? How do you want to be remembered? Do you want to leave a legacy? Do you want to be remembered this time? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Na. That was wonderful. Um, as Janae mentioned, uh, we are happy to be welcoming Na and Michael both uh, to our artist residencies this year, uh, and we'll be sharing a bit more about what that means uh, at the end of the program. But for now, I'm Tainum Fotheringill, and I'm the program manager for Civic Saturday at Citizen University. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's newly minted, newly minted. Um, I'd like to take a minute to explain uh, what Civic Saturday is all about. Uh, so who here has never been to a Civic Saturday? If you're able, raise your hand. Oh, good crowd. Good. Keep them up. Keep them up if you're able. Uh, for those of you who have been before, please turn to someone with their hand raised and say hello and welcome. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, you all have such like great energy this morning. Okay, we're wrapping it. We're wrapping it up. So, um, thank you all for joining us here today, uh, and I hope you find this time and community really valuable uh, on this Saturday morning. Um, you've already found your programs on your chairs. Whether you're new or returning, we hope the information in the program will ground you in what we're doing here today and what we're building both inside and outside of this room. Uh, and we'd like to take you back in time to uh, November 10th, as you'll notice here, uh, and give you some extra holiday prep uh, as, as the holidays are fast approaching. So sorry about that, uh, but uh, you're welcome also. Um, the programs have information about Civic Saturday, but also the song lyrics uh, so you can fully participate uh, and share your voice. So what's gonna happen here today? You've already heard from our Civic Saturday poet, Na, We'll have community members come up and share readings of what we like to call civic scripture, which are excerpts, texts, and writings that reflect on the American creed. Eric Liu will deliver a civic sermon, and we'll share our thoughts and ideas about civic circles. And why do we do all this, gathering in this way? Because at Citizen University, we believe that this moment in time calls for fellowship and connecting around a common civic purpose, that strong democracy, depends on strong citizens. We gather in this way to challenge each other, to connect, and to reflect. By being here, we are choosing not to succumb to the moral cynicism that has taken hold of American civic life. By being here with us today, you're helping us build what that other way can look like. So thank you for building with us and bearing with us. <laughs> um, for the next few moments here, we're gonna have time to connect with each other. So turn to a neighbor, preferably somebody you don't already know, and ask one another, when was a time that you felt you were directing events, and when was a time that you felt events were directing you? <laughs> Just kidding. So um, we'll have eight minutes here, uh, and if you haven't uh, switched in four minutes, we'll ask that you do that, so go ahead. All right, we're bringing it back, bringing it back, um, wrapping up conversations. I know it's hard to cut off the wonderful talks. Hey -oh. And with that, let's welcome Michael and Jim up to the stage. Hello. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, if you are able to, ple uh, please uh, sing along with us and, and please stand while we sing. So if you would, please stand if you are able. So this uh, Keep Your Eyes on the Prize was inspired by Mavis Staples, although this isn't exactly the Mavis Staples version. In my infinite wisdom, I sent over some newish lyrics. So we're going to have a Civic Saturday version of uh, Keep Your Eyes on the Prize. So the only thing that's really different at the end of these, each phrase is we're going to say hold on twice. And uh, so that's, that's how it will be a little different. And we have a lovely rhythm section here, and this is a very driving rhythm, so just keep with it. Please do sing out, and, uh, and it's, gonna be, it's gonna be really fun. Hold on. So glad this is being filmed. 
filmed and on camera, so for all to see. All right, I'm Kayla. Hello, everybody. Um, all right, so I'm excited now to welcome up our three readers who can come on up, Lamar, Jen, and Robin. Um, if you've been here before, uh, you know we have these three readers who uh, come up and read what we call civic, civic scripture, and they provide some context and food for thought prior to Eric's sermon. So we encourage you, as they come up, to think about the thread that weaves these pieces together. Come on up and watch your step. Okay. <laughs> okay. 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, ratified July 9th, 1868. Section 1. All persons, or all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Right <laughs> Excerpt from Chinese Exclusion Act, signed by President Chester Arthur, May 6, 1882. An act to execute certain treaty stipulations relating to Chinese. Whereas, in the opinion of the government of the United States, the coming of Chinese laborers to this country endangers the good order of certain localities within the territory thereof. Therefore, being enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that from and after the expiration of 90 days next after the passage of this act, and until the expiration of 10 years next after the passage of this act, the coming of Chinese laborers to the United States be, and the same is hereby suspended. And during such suspension, it shall not be lawful for any Chinese laborer to come, or having so come after the expiration of said 90 days to remain within the United States. Section 14, that hereafter no state court or court of the United States shall admit Chinese to citizenship, and all laws in conflict with this act are hereby repealed. Excerpt from the United States Supreme Court ruling, Wong Kim Ark versus the United States, decided March 28, 1898. A child born in the United States of parents of Chinese descent, who at the time of his birth are subjects of the Emperor of China, but have a permanent domicile and residence in the United States, and are there carrying on business, and are not employed in any diplomatic or official capacity under the Emperor of China, becomes at the time of his birth a citizen of the United States by virtue of the first clause of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Thank you very much uh, to our readers. and. Um, Thanks to all of you for joining us uh, this morning at Civic Saturday. Um, I also want to, before I begin, um, thank and acknowledge our friends at the Seattle Channel who have been uh, regularly with us to uh, uh, document these uh, gatherings, and also our friend uh, Karen Maeda Allman from Elliott Bay Books, uh, who we hope you'll visit uh, uh, later in the morning. Um, I'm so grateful to be here uh, with you this morning. I'm so grateful to spend this time together, and I want to welcome you. Uh, to the Impact Hub. Uh, this is actually uh, our home at Citizen University. Our offices are just upstairs. Uh, and this space, as some of you may know, is both a co-working space uh, and a broader ecosystem of civic innovators in our town. City Club Seattle is here, Puget Sound Sage, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, Yes Magazine, Social Venture Partners, uh, and others. Uh, the Hub is both a new and an old idea. And like Pioneer Square or Seattle itself, or any place that prides itself on having a history of newness, it meshes time frames. The topic of time is on my mind this time of year. How quickly time flies, how slowly it passes, how hard it is to have a consistent sense of time in these times. That's partly because I've been on the road so much over the last year, zigzagging between time zones and eras, 
meeting people who are innovating for the 22nd century, while a few miles away their neighbors are living in conditions from the 19th century. And it's partly because each day now brings a new scientific warning that time is running out even more rapidly than we thought to avoid the most catastrophic consequences of climate change. It's quite a time to be alive. Earlier this week, I sat in on a talk about a forthcoming business book called The Real-Time Revolution. Its message was that customers now demand everything in real time, and so companies need to respond accordingly. That insight itself was not particularly rev revelatory. There was no examination about whether this was good or bad, and no sense of irony that a slow-moving technology called a book was being used to persuade people that a slow-moving habit like reading books was becoming obsolete. But the reason I was glad that I went th to this talk is that it got me thinking about time, about time and citizenship, and how the consumer expectation of instantaneity is killing our capacity to govern ourselves in a democracy. At Citizen University, we encourage people to serve others, to understand issues, to start clubs, to gather in common rituals like this, to argue with more heart and more wisdom. But underlying all these collective actions is the tapestry of time. To be a great citizen, to be a truly useful contributor to the life of the entire community, each of us must do more than simply learn power and cultivate character. Each of us must also master time. We've got to develop an awareness of how to use time and become alert to the game riggers who want to manipulate our sense of time. We've got to understand where we sit in time and how to distinguish our now from another's now. And today, I want to explore three aspects of time that shape our civic lives. Tempo, horizons of time, and patterns. Let's start with tempo. So American life is getting faster and faster. We move and consume and react and judge at ever accelerating speeds. But who is composing this ubiquitous soundtrack? And who is conducting it? Social media and technology in general, everything from one-click ordering to urgent email fundraising pleas to the breaking news chiron on CNN to the Pavlovian notification number on Facebook, all these things make us crave ever more rapid response and ever more fleeting ways to satisfy the craving. Psychologists call this the hedonic treadmill. In both the economic and civic spheres, these systems of accelerated time are in a very real sense rigged. Algorithms rewire our body rhythms. They're designed for addictive effect. And if you pay close attention, in both realms, the people who design the rigging are unlike most of us. They don't yield to the addiction. Did you ever notice that Jeff Bezos and Sheryl Sandberg and Jeff Zucker at CNN and Steve Bannon, they don't seem to be hunched over their phones tapping for updates every 15 seconds. <laughs> Did you ever notice that, the, that very powerful people are never running from one meeting to the next? Mm -hmm. They are the puppeteers. We are the puppets. They turn on the music and crank up the treadmill. We run and run faster. And we often pay for the privilege. The one seeming exception to this rule happens to be Donald Trump. But in his own surrender to Twitter time and to the metabolism of social media, he is in fact the greatest puppeteer of them all. He dictates the tempo of American politics to a, gre to a degree greater than any previous American president. He is also, as David Shields points out in his incisive new book, Nobody Hates Trump More Than Trump, more deeply representative of the American people's lack of self-control and of the chopped up rhythms of American culture than any other president in modern memory. No puppet, you're the puppet. <laughs> our, first our first responsibility in civic life then is to move at our own tempos, to be intentional about tempo. Now that doesn't mean necessarily always slowing down. Always moving slowly is as stupid as always moving quickly. Stupidest of all though, is moving to a cadence you have no hand in setting. In classical music, concertos and symphonies have three or four movements, usually alternating between fast and slow. If they were only one or the other, 
no one would listen all the way through. But when we perceive a design, a deliberate alternation of tempos, we give not just our attention, but our respect. Here is someone who can play with time, a composer, a conductor, not just a spectator. And we remember then that we too have this power to conduct and compose ourselves. Let me remind you how Emma Gonzalez, one of the Parkland High School students behind the March for Our Lives, opened her speech at the rally in Washington last March. She opened with six minutes and 20 seconds of silence, the amount of time it took for the Parkland massacre to unfold. Now, all I gave you just now was six or seven seconds, but it was enough to slow your pulses and recenter you. Now, sometimes faster is better. The way Lin Manuel Miranda taught the American Revolution and the Federalist Papers works for more people than the way AP history textbooks do. <laughs> Hamilton's hip hop is sticky, it plays, it provokes. Yet sometimes faster is better, and still it's not enough. The way Lin-Manuel Miranda taught would not enable you to pass an AP history exam or to make informed, nuanced judgments about how to regard the founders who were enslavers or what to do about a monument to such a man. That takes slow study and silent contemplation. Can you compose a civic life that alternates between fast and slow? Seattle now is moving both too quickly and too slowly to deal with growth. That's why local politics is so turbulent now. But how do you sift the too quick from the too slow? Too quick to yield to builders? Too slow to listen to neighbors? Or vice versa? Is it your neighbors who have been too slow to accept change? Is it you? Think it through, honestly. In a couple of weeks, most of us, if we're lucky, will get to slow down. That's what the holidays are for. But outside of the enforced and societally accepted blocks of time, when we get to step off the treadmill and reset our pace for a day, we as citizens must remind each other how to perceive and use time in a democracy, how to listen, how to learn, when to respond at once, and when to respond not at all how to know when speed saves and when speed kills. Most of all, how to take control of how you spend your time and your attention, which are currencies of your own civic power. I am by nature an impatient person. That has served me well in many ways. It has limited me in other ways. And today's, in today's environment of instantaneity is becoming, I think, net harmful to me. That's why as I grow older, I seek to lash myself to the mast more often, to resist the siren song of speed. I developed a corny habit that grew out of a time when Genet was, shall we say, encouraging me to be less impatient. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? Patience is my middle name. Which was a joke both because I'm not patient, but also because my actual middle name is P, just the letter P with a period. So, I actually could claim that patience is my middle name. <clears throat> so when I'm sitting on the tarmac now in a delayed flight or listening to a long-winded colleague at a board meeting, I now say a little mantra to myself. Eric, patience, Lou. Eric, patience, Lou. Eric, patience, Lou. It's as close to Buddhist meditation as I'm going to get this year. But next year and the year after, and for the rest of my lengthening or shortening life, depending on your viewpoint, I hope to do better. And that brings me to the second dimension of time that I want to explore today, the horizons of time. Let's pause for a moment and go back to that term, real time. We know that it means now, simultaneous with the saying of it. But why does it mean that? What makes the immediate, the instant, the say it and it's done, any more real than any other conception of time and of, and of the duration of human experience. What does a farmer in Chelan think real time is? What does a scientist at the University of Washington who's untangling the human genome or extracting Arctic ice cores think real time is? What does a teacher in Tacoma 
or a pastor in Wenatchee think real time is. The farmer, the scientist, the teacher, and the pastor all know other conceptions of time, seasonal, genomic, geologic, apocal, and scriptural time. They have horizons that vary in length, but that are all longer than the perpetual now. This is a matter not just of patience, and it's certainly not a matter of saying that patience is always a virtue. It's simply an acknowledgment that these people in their professional lives must be able to take a long view backward and forward, even as they are doing what is right before them in the moment. So must we all in our civic lives. Having a sense of the horizon is a matter of both knowing history and imagining future history. The horizon encircles you from Christmas's past to Christmas's yet to come. Our second responsibility in managing civic time, then, is to be able to locate ourselves in relation to past and future. If tempo was about regulating pace, then horizons is about understanding place, where we stand in time. And fewer of us now can do this. I saw a news item recently that history majors are declining in American colleges and universities. Now, the trend is of a piece with the decline in general in all the humanities, subjects like English and art that seem to technology and career-minded students to be of less practical use than, say, coding. But history as a discipline has recorded the steepest declines of all these fields. And that worries me, not just because I was a history major, but also because coding will soon be automated, while history and its interpretations are forever and can never be. Consider the issue of birthright citizenship. A few days before the midterm elections, as an increasingly worried Donald Trump was rummaging through his toy chest of white supremacist dog whistles, <laughs> he tweeted out that he planned soon to repeal birthright citizenship by executive order. Now, there's a few problems with that. First, of course, it was a white supremacist dog whistle, or actually more like a George Wallace-style bullhorn announcing his nativist intentions. Second problem is, that's not how it's done. By it, I mean amending the Constitution of the United States, which is what you'd have to do if you were to repeal birthright citizenship. Why? Because as we heard in our readings today, birthright citizenship was encoded into Section 1 of the 14th Amendment 150 years ago to ensure that freed slaves born here would become citizens of the United States. And then the principle was applied to all people born here by the US Supreme Court in the 1898 case, United States versus Wong Kim Ark, a case that arose while the Chinese Exclusion Act was still in force. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which we heard a little piece of, was the first time that a group was barred by race from entering the territory. It was the birth of the concept of illegal immigration. Before that, anyone from anywhere could come at any time. It was the culmination of decades of what we would now call Bannonite or Trumpian agitation against Chinese laborers. Although that law had been in effect for over 15 years, the Supreme Court had to agree in this case that the plain language of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment meant that Wong Kim Ark a cook born in San Francisco to immigrant parents who went to visit relatives in China could not be barred from re-entering the United States because he was an American by birth. Now, if you don't know that that's how this issue was decided, and you don't know the history of how we came to have birthright citizenship and how it became enshrined in law, then you may be tempted to think that repeal or not repeal is not your problem. You might think it's a problem just for brown people crossing the border without authorization. You'd be wrong. It's my problem, as a Chinese-American son of immigrants, who has birthright citizenship only because another Chinese-American son of immigrants forced the question in 1890. His story and mine are tied to the stories of formerly enslaved African Americans and all their descendants born here and to all undocumented immigrants ever since Chinese people first defined the category. It's your problem. 
if you're African American. Because birthright citizenship is one of the central triumphs of the black experience in America. As Johns Hopkins historian Martha Jones writes in her revelatory book, Birthright Citizens, the 14th Amendment arose from decades of unheralded, patient, persistent advocacy by free blacks in the antebellum South who asserted and exercised their rights of citizenship in courtrooms and at the ballot box. And it's your problem if you're white because the president is testing you. He is always probing to see how many white people he can manipulate into being scared of a future that's less white and how much of that fear he can convert into hate. So if you are white, you have a responsibility to declare yourself either scared or not scared. And if scared, either succumbing to hate or rejecting it. But all of this, for all of us, requires a view of the past that goes farther back than what's visible on your phone as you scroll down. Put down your damn phone. <laughs> look up, look ahead. The other part of a citizen's responsibility is to see the full horizon and to look to the future. And here, we come up against that pernicious American narcissism of the now that has led every generation since the greatest generation to want to be young forever, to want to extend adolescence, to never grow up. My dear friend Mark Friedman has a new book out called How to Live Forever. But it's not about skin creams or fad diets or putting your name on buildings. It's about the only way that we can, in fact, live forever, and that is to pass on our knowledge and values and to circulate our capital with the younger generations behind us. That's it. Full stop. Mentor, serve, teach, share, and build relationships of caring from generation to generation. Mark's organization, actually, is running a campaign now called Gen to Gen. His organization is called Encore.org trying to popularize the idea of an encore career in what we now think of as retirement. Gen to gen is the only path to immortality, the immortality of character and of wisdom. Mark, with whom, by the way, I'll be in conversation at Finney Neighborhood Center on Monday night, is my sibling in countercultural activism, as is everyone here today. The dominant culture in our country what we are all together pushing back against has no time horizon. It reduces history and the future to a single point. But we in the counterculture are stretching that point out into a line, into a circle, into a weave of cords that binds generation to generation and each of us to one another. That's the only way to make time real, to make it not about now, and to see over time that the great American weave tells its own stories that are truer and deeper than yours or mine alone. And that brings me to the third and final aspect of civic time that I want to discuss today, the patterns that emerge from our choices and judgments. Now, to some people, this is called the holiday season. But to a diehard baseball fan like me, it's what's called hot stove season. The quarter between November and February, when there are no games, but only chatter and gossip over an imaginary hot winter stove to talk about off-season deals and trades. Now, one of the many ways that baseball is life's best teaching tool, in my view, <laughs> is the way that baseball plays with time. It is a game that concentrates all action on the contest between a pitcher who controls the tempo and a batter who responds to the pitch he is dealt. Each such confrontation is packed with revelation. Out of hundreds or thousands of those pitch-by-pitch -pitch confrontations emerge patterns. And what separates a good player from a great one is the ability to see those patterns over time and to adjust to them continuously. In other words, a true baseball player has got to be able to focus on the now, the instant a pitch is released, and at the same time be able to zoom out and be guided by what happened before and at the same time, recognize that what happened before may no longer be relevant and, in fact, may be misleading. 
A true citizen must do each of these things as well. See patterns, make adjustments, adjust. See patterns, make adjustments, adjust. In American civic life today, the word judgment is usually associated with righteous put-downs of someone deemed morally inferior. That, again, is a result of our too fast tempo and our too short horizons. Every offense is a volume 10 outrage now. But citizenship cannot sustain that pace or that intensity. Citizenship, and again, I take pains to say at every turn that when we talk about citizenship at Citizen University, we're not talking about documentation status. We're talking about the deeper ethical sense that we embody here today of being a member of the body a contributor to community. Citizenship in this sense requires discernment and modulation. It requires judgment in the other deeper sense, an ability to make distinctions and to weigh evidence, past and present, and make the best calls we can. Another reason I love baseball, as the documentarian Ken Burns reminds us, is that it is one of the few shared experience that is threaded through the past 170 years one of the few constants between agrarian, white, pre-Civil War America and post-industrial, multiracial America today. It gives fans a consistent set of, set of statistics and metrics by which to judge and compare players across different eras. It also gives rise to debates about the very nature of judgment and comparison. Is it fair to compare hitters from the dead ball era at the turn of the 20th century with hitters of the steroid era? More pointedly, should every record from the era before Jackie Robinson integrated the game in 1947 be considered a less than legitimate measure of greatness? I was thinking about this when I saw a picture the other day of the 1948 Yale baseball team captain, George Herbert Walker Bush, who played first base and led the Bulldogs to the College World Series twice now this, of course, was after he had flown dozens of combat missions in the Second World War as the Navy's second youngest aviator. Most of the rest of his crowded life was in public. And so from the moment of Bush's death, there was a flood of commentary online and off about whether he should be respected or resented, <coughs> celebrated or scorned. Now Bush is not a figure to whom I would apply absolutes. Part of it is his genuinely complex record, ending the Cold War effectively, bucking his party on taxes, exercising strength and restraint in Iraq. Good. Willie Horton, AIDS neglect, bad. Part of it, though, is also the refraction of present circumstance. Next to Trump, every recent president looks relatively better, <laughs> especially one who was skydiving and witnessing gay marriages when he was 90. But a great part of my reluctance to issue binary good-evil judgments on the elder Bush is the larger trend that we are experiencing right now as a society of judging leaders of the past by the standards or modes of the present. You see this now among progressives who, for instance, cannot abide Winston Churchill because he was racist, imperialist, and sexist. Historians call this the fallacy of anachronism or presentism. Now, Churchill did have racist views about Indians and others. He was an unapologetic champion of empire and its brutal ways. But he was not exceptional in that. Such views were the norm. He was exceptional in his vision and gifts of leadership. Let me put it plainly. No Churchill, no us. Had he not been on the scene, the Nazis would have commanded all Europe and threaten the United States directly. The American century would have been stillborn. I know, I myself have now committed the fallacy of causation. We cannot truly know. We can only imagine what might have been had one key person been subtracted from the equation. There's a great Star Trek episode about this. <laughs> City on the Edge of Forever, about a social worker in the 1930s. And Captain Kirk dropped into her time falls in love with her, but he must let her die in a car accident he knows is going to happen. Because if she lives, he knows also that she will lead a pacifist movement 
that will delay American entry into the Second World War long enough for Hitler to get the atom bomb. No Allied victory, no Federation of Planets, no Starfleet, no Captain Kirk. But that's science fiction. It is not science fiction to say that Churchill saved the free world long enough for Franklin Roosevelt to really save it. How then do we judge Churchill? How do we judge FDR, who cheated on his wife, lied to the press, tried to pack the court, and in his greatest act of infamy, incarcerated American citizens of Japanese descent on a trumped up case of military necessity? The answer must be, we judge with both moral clarity and humility, and with a willingness to calibrate our judgments. Franklin Roosevelt was, on balance, the greatest president of the 20th century, and behind only Washington and Lincoln in saving the nation from destruction. Now, George Bush's generation is just about gone now, and so maybe our judgments of all of his generation will become, over time, less gauzy and soft more honest, more complicated. It's been 150 years now since the 14th Amendment was ratified, a century now since the slaughter of the Great War ended, 50 years since the chaotic bloodshed of MLK and RFK's assassinations, of Chicago and the Democratic Convention, of the Tet Offensive. Look forward now. How will we be judged? 50. 100, 150 years from now. Well, that depends in part on whether society as we know it will exist in any of those time scales. Climate scientists tell us now, in bold face, all caps, what the patterns of the last two centuries, and especially the last five decades, suggest about our future. They suggest peril. They suggest that we will be judged harshly for not having done more during the planet's greatest hour of peril, for, in fact, choosing to do even less precisely at that hour, when you consider that American oil production and carbon emissions and SUV sales hit new highs this year. How shall we break this pattern? If you're a climate activist, you should actually like Churchill, warts and all, because the man wrote the book, literally, on how to persist in pushing a cause for decades, even when people think you are a one-note crackpot, all the while using every tool of power at your disposal, from lectures and essays to service in government, to advance your cause. Now, Churchill's cause was containing fascists and resisting appeasement. The closest that environmentalists have to a Churchill today is Al Gore. And there's no doubt that an inconvenient truth with its haunting computer-modeled imagery of coastal flooding and rampant wildfires, now looks like prophecy. But Churchill had the benefit, if I can put it this way, of Hitler. Hitler forced action and events in such a way that proved Churchill right and brought this nation, brought his nation and eventually our nation, onto his side. Gore today has only the reports of scientists and large multinational meetings and conferences and agreements. There is no single arch villain to awaken the conscience. There's just us in a thousand points of selfishness and short-term hoarding. The villain is nowism. The villain is human nature, which absent leadership and a strong social norm to the contrary will always discount future benefit to avoid present pain. But as George Bush reminded us, there's also in human nature a thousand points of light, an innate willingness to serve, sacrifice, and act for others for benefits you can't yet imagine. The leadership, though, will come not from some president or great figure. It can and will come from us. It must. The Yellow Vest protesters now in France, like the voters, on Initiative 1631, the carbon tax initiative, in every Washington county outside King, Jefferson, and San Juan, these folks think that the choice we face today is between paying higher taxes and having more money in your pocket. 
The real choice, though, is between paying higher taxes now and system collapse very soon. To quote Yogi Berra, it gets late early out here. <laughs> we can relate to that as, winter sol as the winter solstice approaches here in Seattle. But it is not too late for us to organize. It is not too late for us to educate. It is not too late for us to tell a different story, to listen to why people in Pierce and Snohomish, much less Spokane or Ferry County, resist this green story, and to respond to the patterns we notice, to use every channel at our disposal, to bring to bear that Churchillian spirit of tireless mobilization of every craft at our disposal, and to inspire with a confident relentlessness that borders on the insane. It was nearly insane to think that England would prevail in 1938. It is not insane to think that American democracy or human civilization can survive in 2018. It just requires imagination and action. So let me close then with a nod to the great theater artist Anne Bogart. Anne Bogart has described a system of directing actors that focuses on what she calls viewpoints, dimensions of time and space that a performer must be aware of as she moves across a stage. Bogart talks about tempo and duration in a way that lines up roughly with the dimensions of tempo, horizon, and pattern that I've talked about today. But the main point of her teaching is that there is never any single tempo or duration, no single form of repetition or response that is inherently or inalterably correct. The point of developing one's craft on stage is to have a full repertoire of moves and viewpoints on time and then full command of that repertoire to use as the situation demands and inspires. As it is in theater, so it is in citizenship. How do we, as members of the body, develop that repertoire and that command? In the first place, by naming the phenomenon. Time matters. Command of time matters. Don't just let time rush past as if you were a cork bobbing along the river. In the second place, by practicing. Think about the tempo, the horizons, and the patterns of time as they play out in your neighborhood, in our city, in our country. Consider how to adjust your viewpoints of time and space so that someone who's does not, who does not share your viewpoints can see you. Each of us as citizens is both director and actor now. Responding kinesthetically, as Bogart would say, to each other's moves and motives and sense of time. No president, even after this one is gone, can save us from our own inattention and indifference. Citizen Wong Kim Ark did not submit to the injustice of circumstance. He did not await a president to save him. And he did not submit to the threat of deportation when he was detained at San Francisco Harbor in 1890. He fought. He gained allies in and out of court, speaking English and Chinese. And he won after eight long years of fighting. Others noticed. Still others remember. Now, time since then has been both cruel and kind to other Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, people of color, immigrants, refugees, children of immigrants and refugees, descendants of slaves, and to plenty of white people in pain, privation, and privilege. Only we will save one another. A strong democracy requires strong citizens. Strong citizens believe that we can make change happen and that we have the responsibility to try. It's time to believe. It's time to make that belief contagious. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Please open your hymnals to page two. <laughs> We're going to dial that time back to 1970 with a song called Big Yellow Taxi Made Famous by Joni Mitchell. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So this can be about many things, a relationship, a politician you miss, the environment, whatever you may uh, want to apply it to. Uh, but if you would please stand with me. And ladies, please 
I sing out as this is very low in my register, or people with a uh, higher higher registers. So we're in uh, the key of G. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Michael and Jim. Once more, that was great. Um, we're gonna now, yes, give it up. Um, we're gonna now move into civic circles. So in a moment, I'll ask you to self-organize into groups of five or six. Uh, if you wanna spread out this way and rearrange chairs, please do that. Um, so take the lead, grab a chair and form your circle and invite folks to join you. Whoever ends up in your circle is meant to be there. Uh, once you all form your circles, I'll give just a couple ground rules and the topic for today. So start moving around here, groups of five or six. Our topic for today is how can we sharpen our sense of time to make greater civic impact? And one or two ground rules before we start. When others are speaking, try and really hear them uh, and make sure that everybody in your circle gets a chance to speak. So in about 20 minutes, we'll come back and do some community announcements. But for now, the time is yours to talk about this. Go ahead. Like, even if I only have like an hour of free time a day, like that's a lot of time. Um, there's a lot of value that could come out of that time. Acting for things that I really care about, what you said truly makes sense. Like, not doing something or doing something. Like, otherwise, I would never know. So prioritizing issues and um, just maybe going out of the box, things I would have never done before, trying those out. Sort of feels like the opportunities to, to connect with people and actually, or, or to connect with what's going on or, or pass you by. I'm a drop in the ocean, you know, not, I'm not necessarily as likely to make that change. So where else can I do that? Like there's always this tension between what you can do as an individual and what you can push for in larger action. The course of the next year's Civic Saturdays and bringing in other artists um, from the Seattle community to do the same. They're also going to be organizing groups outside of Civic Saturday where you can build community through music and writing. So I'd love to invite Michael and Na to come on up and share a little bit about what these groups are gonna be. Um, and we will have uh, sign-ups afterwards with both of them for more intro to get sign up on an interest list to get more information as it becomes available. So come on up. Yeah. So I was just thinking about wanting to in incorporate the the congregation a little more than just having you stand and sing a song, uh, you know, that you just saw today. And if there are musicians in the crowd, if there are people that have sung in choirs, things of this nature, we'd really love to talk to you and get together and rehearse some songs for Civic Saturdays to perform and make it more inclusive in terms of we get to work out uh, um, you know, unique parts and, and people play new instruments. If you ne are not used to playing instruments, this will be an opportunity to, uh, I don't know, just sort of you know, spread, spread the music a little bit more and uh, make it a little more inclusive that way. So there will be a sign up. Uh, we could take some of your information and I'd love to talk to you. And uh, there it is right there. And uh, the next the next Civic Saturday here is in February. Uh, yes, and it will be at Elton Prison Live Action. And, and so we would love to get together and rehearse some tunes and perform at that Civic Saturday and maybe others in the future. But uh, yeah, so come and come and uh, sign up if you are interested. Thank you so much. I wrote my stuff down. It is our duty to start the process of becoming healthy and sound in our mind, body, heart, and soul. This is where we gather to share, investigate, reevaluate, revisit, and center ourselves through writing, guided breath work, and vocal toning, which is the use of your voice to balance your body's energy. We can only help others by helping ourselves first because community is a verb and citizen is a verb too. I say all of that to welcome you to healing, to the healing servant, ooh, healing civic circle. Civic healing circle. I was like, I knew. I was just like, you're switching up your words now. Yes, civic healing circle. This is what I am, I am offering to you. I am offering to you to reevaluate and to revisit what we just talked about. Civic, the Civic Saturday is every other month. 
So within those every other months, those in-betweens, you'll be with me. You'll be with me reevaluating and revisiting the things that have been talked about here. Not only that, through writing prompts and small discussions, but we will also be led into guided breath work, vocal toning, where you are using yourself as your only, as your, as your healing mechanism. So I am only guiding you. You will guide yourself also into healing yourself and to touch upon different feelings and emotions that might hinder you or share and encourage what you have done as a citizen, as a civic citizen. So that is what's gonna happen and it's gonna happen in January and then it'll happen again in some other time in between. But I hope that you gain something from it and uh, it will be way more precise than when I'm sending it to you right now. Okay? Uh, yes, so Civic Healing Circle, you can go over there to uh, sign up if you're interested. And I know, I don't usually say this, but I know it'll be worth your time. Thank you so much. We are so excited to see how those roll out and um, to see how you all participate. So thank you to Nat and Michael. There's also a few other folks in the room who've expressed interest in getting together for various groups. So when we do community announcements, if people want to um, share that out, please do. Uh, let's see. So speaking of the new year, all of our 2019 dates, we're so excited. Thank you to Tanem for getting those all booked, are on the back of our program. So the next one will be February 2nd, as we said, at El Centro de la Raza. Um, we also are very excited to be a part of Town Hall's month of reopening um, on April 6th. So um, yes, yay to Town Hall, and you can find us there. Um, as we always do, we'll be posting the sermon uh, and readings uh, this afternoon on our website and our Facebook page. And on a Citizen University personal note, for those of you who have been around the organization for uh, any amount of time, you know our dear colleague, Ben Phillips, over here. Ben will be leaving us. This is his final Civic Saturday. He will be moving on to go to grad school to uh, continue doing good in the world. So let's give him a big round of applause. It is most certain that the organization would not be where it is without Ben, so we will miss him dearly and hope he will come back to visit us all the time. Um, okay, so let's open it up for community announcements. If you have a brief uh, thing you'd like to share out with the group, please raise your hand. All right, on that note, I'd like to bring up Na to close us out. We gather like sunrise, form circles like recess. We stand receptive allowing our ears and heart to dialogue. We smile clouds, hoping it leaves comfort. Come forth and know that you matter here. Thank you.